Bill Castle bought the novel, and he wanted to direct it. And I read it, and I said, I'll buy it today, but you can't direct it. If I can't direct it, I'm not going to do it. I said, OK, you have a three-year exclusive contract here. You'll hold it, and if you get the picture made. Bill Castle was a wonderful man. His problem was he made the cheapest horror movies you could make, and he was a great flacker. I mean, the publicity things that he did, the way he got people interested with vibrating seats and feelies and, you know, it was all this cheap stuff that he did, but he was great. He was charming, funny, and he, and he made a lot of money doing it. He produced the picture, and then we went out to look for a director, but I always wanted to do something with Roman. I saw a cul-de-sac, and he had just come in. He had done The Vampire Killers, which was not a successful film, but the things in it that were extraordinary. And Roman thought he wasn't interested in doing it. He was looking to do a ski picture. Bob Evans knew that I was a, a ski fanatic, and I would be attracted by a ski project. And he also said, and I have these galleys here. It was a bunch of yellow book galleys. He says, I want you to read this also. The skiing picture we were going to do at one point was downhill racer. He wanted to do a ski picture, so I have this, but I have this too. Can you read the galleys first? I say, well, I, I, wanted, <laughs> I thought you wanted me to do the ski uh, film. And he says, yes, but this is something very important, and I, you may like it. I says, oh, okay. I say, fine, I'll go. And I went to the hotel and started reading the thing. It felt like soap opera, the first few pages. And I thought, is, he, is it not a mistake? I continued. And by 4 o'clock in the morning, I was still reading with my eyes burning. And in the morning, I came to the studio. I said, yes. Uh, that's a good thing. And uh, he said, well, let's do it. And that's how Rosemary's baby began. You know what he said? I thought it was a soap opera. That was the best clue he had. And we used it. Rosemary baby opens like a Doris Day movie. That's the whole point. Oh, oh God. Yeah. <gasps> Fireplace works, of course. Oh, oh, it's a wonderful apartment. I love you it. See what she's trying to do? She's trying to get you lower the rent. <laughs> yes, well, we'd raise it if we were allowed. One of my first requests when I was uh, asked to come to Hollywood to do this film, before any cast, before anything, was Dick Silbert. We talked about someday doing a movie together. That's how I got to do Rosemary's Baby. Dick Silver's a brilliant, brilliant production designer. I told uh, Bob Evans, can we use Dick Silver? And I gave him the galleys of the book to read immediately before I even adapted the book. And uh, Dick agreed. And he told me, there is a building you must see, it's the Dakota. And so when, when we went to New York, there was the first place he showed me. He also showed other buildings. Roma didn't know New York. I spent 35 years in New York. There's not a place in that book that I didn't know what it should be like. Well, the Dakota even then even had more of a history to it than it has today. It was more eerie then. I don't recall whether Ira Levin had the Dakota in mind when he was writing the novel, but uh, as far as we, are, we were concerned, that was our immediate decision. I think it's, it's one of the main characters in the picture. Are you aware that the Bramford had rather an unpleasant reputation around the turn of the century? It's where the Trench sisters conducted their little dietary experiments. Adrian Mercado lived there, too. The Trench sisters were two proper Victorian ladies. They cooked and ate several young children, including a niece. Oh, lovely. Adrian Mercado practiced witchcraft. Rosemary's Baby was the first time that I used the material uh, from another source, as they say in the academy jargon. I spent 30 days at the beach house with Roman working on that script after his first draft. First he did his draft. His work on the script with Gerard Brock was extraordinary. He's a very good writer. My God! 
It's Vidal Sassoon. It's very in. What's wrong with you? Do I look that bad? Terrible. You're not on one of those Zen diets, are you? No. Then what is it? Have you seen a doctor? Perhaps I might as well tell you. I'm pregnant. I imagine Rosemary differently at the beginning. I imagine her more like she's in the book, healthy, uh, milk-fed, uh, uh, American, all-American girl. Me, I had this very delicate quality, and that's not how I thought of Rosemary when I was adapting the book. He wanted Tuesday well, and I wanted Mia Farrow. Uh, she was uh, then popular in, uh, in the television show. Mia Farrow at that time was on Peyton Place. Bob thought that she would be a good Rosemary. It was important for him to have some kind of a name. And Mia meant something to the American audience through the television. She was absolutely unknown in the rest of the world, particularly in Europe. Nobody knew who Mia Farrow was. But meeting Mia, uh, I quickly realized that she would be very good for that part. I, I just saw Mia as that quality, that eerie quality uh, uh, about her. I, I didn't know her, I just had seen her, you know. And, um, and I think she was marvelous in it. Mia had something that, as we know in, in hindsight, was special. Just that little extra, and which I think is this tremendous vulnerability. I'm going to Dr. Hill Monday morning. Dr. Saperstein is either lying or he's, I don't know, out of his mind. Pain like this is a warning something's wrong. Is we're going to have trouble with her? I know we are, Bob. If we go, there'll be some problem. He was right, there was problems. But not with her, it was her marriage with Frank, etc. But Frank Sinatra, you got married to when you were the wife. She wanted to leave, to be with Frank. She was madly in love with Frank. And I took her in, I showed her an hour of cut footage. I said, you're going to win the Academy Award on this. This is better than Audrey Hepburn and they're waiting till dark. This is extraordinary. Suddenly, she didn't want to get on a plane to leave. Rosemary, you got the best doctor in New York. You know who Dr. Hill is? He's a Charlie nobody. That's who he is. Casavetes was my idea. I was looking originally also for a more of an old American boy. Our original choice was uh, Robert Redford. Redford would have been perfect. I mean, what you wanted was a matinee idol. I remember that even Jack Nicholson was somehow considered. I didn't know him yet uh, in those times. I, done, I think we just briefly met. So I knew John, and I thought he was... a terrific actor. John did a wonderful job. I had done a picture with John just before, a few years before, called uh, Edge of the City, Marty Ritz's first picture. So we knew each other very well. There is nothing more subjective that, that causes more arguments, healthy ones, than casting. It's every, you know, they say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, so is casting. Hello, how are you? Fine, may I come in a minute? Yes, of course, please do. I just come over to thank you for saying those nice things to us the other night. Oh, no, please. Poor Terry, we thought maybe we failed her some way. Though her note made it crystal clear we had, and she'll never know how helpful it was in such a shock moment. So I do thank you, Roman does too. Roman's my hubby. I just know that Ruth, whatever she does, if you saw Harold and Maud, how do you tell a story about an 18-year-old boy falling in love with an 80-year-old woman and get away with it. He can with Ruth Gordon. I knew Ruth because Gawson Kanan, her husband, was a friend of mine, and I had done a pilot film for him in New York. Casting of Ruth Gordon in the picture was a part of the whole enterprise. I thought of all those secondary roles in the, uh, in the book in a certain way, and I thought that I would like to use all the Hollywood actors for this part in order to explain what I really wanted to the casting director of, of the studio at that time, I drew all the characters. And I said that the physical aspect of each uh, of those characters was more important to me than some kind of acting abilities. His vision of these characters was what started that, you know, what he wanted. 
And you'd have to be Roman to have made that choice. He's very good with actors because he's an actor himself. He's a good actor. Better director, but he's a good actor. All the directors that I've really liked, I like them all, but I'm ones that I've spent most of my time with, were actors. Lara Louise is this guy's wife, Rosemary. Hello, Rosemary, and welcome to the brand. Lara Louise just met Guy. She wanted to meet you, too. Could we come in? Uh, of course, please. Yes, there you are. Go ahead. Patsy Kelly was also one of those actors who fit the description, or rather the drawings that I did for them. She was terrific, actually. She was fun to work with, too. It's interesting to put an actor in a part that you don't expect him to do. But it's more fun to use Patsy Kelly in a part like that than to have her play a comic part. You've seen it before. I was uh, maybe 34, which seems young today, but at that time I, I felt like a total adult and I was furthermore completely and inhibited and had no problems in directing old Hollywood veterans. I just felt very at ease with them. And it was a tremendously pleasurable experience to work with this bunch. They were terrific. Maybe all this is coincidence, but one thing is for sure, they have a coven and they want my baby. Certainly seems that way. I was afraid you wouldn't believe me. I don't believe in witchcraft, but there are plenty of maniacs and crazy people in this city. Chuck Roden was tested for the graduate with Dustin. And there I see this performance of this guy. He was terrific. And that's when I said to Roman, you've got to meet this guy. I remember Dick Silbert told me about uh, this actor. He says, that's a great New York guy. You should try him. I don't remember whether we made a test. It wasn't a very large part, but he was very good in it. And from then on, he never stopped working. Is this Donald Baumgart? That's right. This is Rosemary Woodhouse. Guy Woodhouse's oh, wife? Oh, yeah. I want My to know... Guy. You must be a happy little lady these days, I just... huh? Living in the brown rows of uniform. I wanted to know how you are, if there's been any improvement. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> Tony Curtis, who was a friend, also a friend of Mia's, came on the set once. Mia hasn't seen him yet when I had the idea of using him to play the voice on the telephone and I asked Tony to do that as a joke and he went on the other end of the wire and talked to her and Mia said I know this voice but she didn't know who it was I said I think now that beside the joke it was also a good thing for her acting because it did something to her, the fact that uh, the voice was familiar and yet she could not guess who was on the other end of the wire. I'm sorry I didn't come along that day he came to visit you. This, no. Oh, oh you, mean, you mean the day we met for, for drinks? Huh? Yes, that's what I mean. Right. My favorite scene is that Doctor's Hill when Dr. Saperstein and Guy come to get her, and when Saperstein slips the pills into his pocket. Come with us quietly, Rosemary. Don't argue or make a scene. Because if you say anything more about witches or witchcraft, we're going to be forced to take you to a mental hospital. Roman is very, very, very clever. Technically. He knows more about lenses than cameramen do. My favorite shot in the movie for some reason is when Rosemary is being put into the car and the driver turns and nods to her and we see that he's one of the secondary witches of whom we could catch a glimpse during the uh, New Year's party. Rosemary, I want you to be Dr. Shand. He used to be a famous dentist. He made the chain for your charm. Oh, how do you do? Yeah. Pick a favorite scene. I say it's the very last scene, because you see nothing and it's scary as hell. Well, I wanted the film to be ambiguous, particularly the ending. I wanted it to be ambiguous. Yes, it, it, it was ambiguous, but it's scary too. What have you done to its eyes? He has his father's eyes. What are you talking about? Guys' eyes are normal. But what really mattered to me is that the audience should not be sure whether she is crazy and, and imagining all those things that are happening to her as a, a plot 
or that the plot really exists. That means that the viewer could either think that these are real witches, that the child was really begot by a devil, or rather that Rosemary has some kind of postpartum madness and believes it all to be true. That's why it's the, the great horror film without any horror in it. And there ain't gonna be no baby. In, in every film, the ending is always the most difficult thing to get. Rocky. You trying to get me to be his mother? Aren't you his mother? I remember once meeting Otto Preminger on the lot, and he said, Roman, why do you look so gloom? I said, we, well, we, 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 f behind, behind, behind what? I said, behind schedule. He says, so what? He says, what about the dailies? I say, they love the dailies. So that's your answer. And indeed, I thought of it. The studio really was uh, very excited about the rushes. Those were great years in Hollywood. They were part of the very beginning of the golden age, of second golden age of movies. Rosemary's Baby stands alone as being the first of his genre. I knew it was going to be a big hit because it, it, it shook people. Now, mind you, this is a picture, call it a horror picture, call it not a horror picture, call it a scare picture, but there are no special effects, there's no screaming thing that's happening, or walls tumbling down, or, or crocodiles coming out of the walls, or anything like that. It's all in the way he shot it, and it works on every level. It scares the hell out of you.